Good morning, good morning. Welcome back from coffee. Glad to see you all made it back. Um, quick phone check again. Make sure phones are off or in flight mode, please, for, for this next session. So where we are now, so this, this session was originally when we thought when we were kind of devising the whole conference. Um, today was about setting the scene this morning of um, change and, and bigger picture issues um, that we need to take into account as waste and resource managers going forward. Um, and then this session was then to look a bit further afield on how other folks are, are dealing with the challenges of our waste and resource industries. And then the panel debate later on will then discuss what we've heard this morning and put that in the context of, OK, are, are there things that we can sort and things that we want to take from what we've heard this morning um, for our future going forward? And then the, the workshops after that will go into niche areas so you all get a chance to um, kind of work in your, your specialist kind of areas and, and do that. So, so this was originally the, the international session. Um, and this was maybe partly because of the referendum and we didn't know which way it was going to go. So technically, Virador would have been international if we had uh, gone the other way last month. Um, but generally, this, this is about, there's a whole bunch of stuff happening um, that we need to be aware of on a, on a European scale, if you like. Um, we've got our own challenges with the way Scotland regulations and um, the things that we deal with. But above that, um, you've got the Waste Framework Directive and you've also got um, the, the Towards a Circular Economy EC communication that came out recently. And what that did was um, sit, put another layer of targets on, on everybody. Um, and I think maybe in Scotland we had the least surprise or maybe the most comfortable about, about, about um, what came out of, of that. Um, so we've now got recycling 70%, uh, municipal solid waste by 2030, packaging waste recycling 80% by 2030, no landfilling of bio waste or recyclable waste by 2025, reduction of food waste generation by 30%, increasing resource productivity by 30% by 2030. And just reading through this, you start getting an idea that, yeah, we're, we're not really surprised with that in Scotland. That fits very well with, with what we have. We're starting talking about our 2025 targets, and um, it, we seem like we're ahead of the curve for once, and, and that's a great place to be. But in context, then, um, the figures in, in Europe were kind of, in, in 2010, total waste production, 2.5 billion tonnes, of which 36% was recycled. And 45 million tonnes could have been recycled or reused, but was burned or landfilled um, instead. So that's the context of things. And again, when you put that back in a Scottish context, you think, we're doing all right. Yeah, we're, we're, we're way up there. Um, and as the UK, then we, we've, we've entered the, the top 10 in Europe of, of recycling nations. Um, and, then, and there's growth there to come. So, so we're not the worst by any means, but there's a, there's a long way to go for all of us, which is what we hear on a, on a regular basis. I think that the, the, that communication had three expected impacts, which I think are, are the key things. Um, stop losing valuable materials. Um, and to me, that's a really easy way of capturing the, 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 the circular economy and, and, and what it's all about and where waste and resources then links into, into that process. Develop new businesses and create jobs. Again, pretty familiar from where we are and um, fits again with Scottish government policy and, and where we want to be and increasing the quality of life. And I'm all up for that. Anyway, uh, you'll hear from me throughout the, throughout the day, but uh, we have um, two speakers today. So first is Ian McCauley um, from Viridor, who can do his own introductions, because I've left him a bit of paper over there. <laughs> and then uh, Vicente uh, Galvan Lopez, Lopez, Galvan Lopez um, from Ferrovia. So we'll hear uh, what's happening in Spain and, and how things and, and the challenges that they're facing over there. So Ian, if you'd like to say Somebody stole the slide. Is it coming? Yes. Thank you. Oh. Green to the floor. Okay. You're going to be so disappointed by the international accent, I can tell you. Good morning, uh, it's a real pleasure to be back in my hometown. Uh, I haven't been I haven't lived here for a, a number of years, but uh, it's always a pleasure to drive back in, especially through the rain. It makes it feel much like home. Um, I was born almost 50 years ago in Govan, just down the way. Uh, and since then, I have uh, become a chartered engineer. 
I've lived in uh, three different countries. I've lived in America, I've lived in Belgium, where incidentally I was told that my English was very good. Uh, so, <laughs> <coughs> obviously I, I can speak some languages. Um, as I, uh, I also lived, I've lived in England uh, for a while, uh, and I've, I think I've been to something like 48 different countries around the world working uh, on holiday, whatever. I, I grew up in the water sector, especially in Scotland, uh, when I first graduated and first worked here. Uh, and now I've transferred over, came back to the, the UK just about a year ago uh, to take over as the chief exec of Viridor. Why do I tell you those things? Um, because what I'm about to speak about is about perspective, my perspective. Hopefully I can add a few things into the discussion today. I'm not here to talk about facts and figures about waste, uh, because I think that's one of our biggest challenges, is about getting perspective into the challenges the sector faces, the things that we have to do to make it real for people, how we speak a language away from things like the circular economy. It's very difficult to, to understand for people who are not embedded in it and passionate about it. My acid test is always my children. I have two girls, are 17 and 16, and if I can get them to understand and be enthused, I know I'm doing the right things. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the perspective of a CEO, uh, things like leadership, strategy, the successes that we have, uh, and not really so much about the circular economy, as I said. So see if this works. A key principle of leadership for me, especially in a time of change, and this is a huge time of change for the waste sector. As I say, I worked in the water sector for 30 years, uh, and I think we have a really good analogy. I remember starting my career here in Scotland, just in Charing Cross in the consultancy, when Scottish water, as was, was spread to the four winds. It was localised out to regional and local authorities. And over the period of years, it consolidated to a reasonable degree, eventually becoming three water authorities, then one. Uh, and it's become one of the most efficient water companies in the UK. It has good comparison, good um, competition from uh, good regulation as well. I think it's a model that we should look at very closely, because I think the analogies there are strong. And for those that worry about, does the waste sector, will it ever get there? Yes, it will. It absolutely will, and it can learn lessons from that. Our challenge is to learn those lessons and apply them and move forward more quickly. So this statement here is, is the first one I use every single day. Absolutes are the enemy of progress. It's not one thing or the other. It's not EFWs are good or bad. It's not national, regional, or local. It's all of those things. And I encourage people to start with what I call the Sean's. So I avoid the temptation to do the Sean Connery accent there. Um, but things like perception, communication, legislation, population. It's about thinking about all of those things, how they fit into the waste hierarchy, how we actually deliver them in practice. And it's about thinking about all of those things all of the time, every single day, and making it a little bit better day after day. The phrase I use is, having the will to win is not as important as having the will to prepare to win. And in our company, the leadership ethos is being prepared. So when we turn up somewhere, we've thought about it, we've thought about the context. And I'll tell you a little bit more about our strategy model as we go forward. Leadership and connectivity is required at all levels. So it's not about CEOs and ministers and the heads of local government, heads of councils. It's about getting those people setting a vision and aspirations and then connecting the actions. But it's also about listening as well. So we have to listen to society, we have to listen to our customers, we have to take on board what they're doing, and we have to connect all those things up and keep improving. It's also about looking further afield, which is very important. This industry is a technology laggard. It's in its infancy, and conventionally, commodity prices have been far lower than the cost of technology and the capacity of technology. That's coming into balance now. This industry will change radically through technological innovation. So we need to look at where else it's happening, be that the oil and gas sectors, be it in California, where there's some really good stuff going on, continental Europe, and we need to apply all those lessons. And as I said, every single day. There is no one thing. The most frustrating question I get, and I got it last week from BBC uh, down south, was what's the one thing that's going to change the waste sector? It doesn't work that way. It really doesn't. There is no one solution. That's the one question that frustrates me, and I, also, I always answer it by saying uh, the one thing that will change the waste sector is if people keep asking, stop asking about what's the one thing that will change it, and apply themselves to all of these mechanisms. So, leadership. 
What's it all about? Well, as I said, it's about setting an aspiration, setting a bar. Leaders set a point of destination. Managers put the steps in place to get there. It's really positive for me being in Scotland and seeing the leadership that Scotland is showing. You know, we talked this morning about the 1st of January 2014, and this was our uh, social media communication about the new waste regulations. They've been put in force. Zero waste is becoming a common term now. We are moving forward, and Scotland is leading the way. They've set out a national aspirational standard, but now we need to look at how do we turn that into practice? How do we make it real? And there are great examples. So we're currently working in Glasgow, for example, and those that saw BBC News, it's not our plant that's on fire. If anybody saw it, ours is working just fine, thank you. It's in fire in the right way, uh, hopefully soon. Uh, but that plant is a really, really good example of a joined up vision and an action plan. It's about taking us away from waste into resource. It's about recycling, reuse, recovery, and actually, ultimately, the alleviation of heat poverty. It's a very, very good piece of social infrastructure, but it started with a vision and leadership as well. So I think it's, it's critical that we look at those type of things. So we get the national level, the local and regional levels, and then you bring business in as well, and business needs to help create that action agenda. And they're actually quite good at it as well. So you, know, you can look at Glasgow, you can look at Edinburgh Midlothian, you can look at Clyde Valley, South Lanarkshire, you can see that they're putting the interpretation of national aspirations and targets into practice. And I think it's quite successful. And other parts of the UK look quite enviously at Scotland in that regard. But businesses have to come into it as well. So people like Coca-Cola, uh, with a zero, zero to landfill policy in place already. Um, we're working with Glasgow University, and in just one year, they've gone from 16% recycling to 72% recycling. The successes are there, and it is happening. The uh, challenge for me, and one of the biggest challenges, is getting this clear focus on resources. Uh, and we, we need to move on from the low value perspective of waste. And we still talk about waste too much for me. We've tried to eliminate it from our language. If you look at the picture, like, what do you see? Is, is always my challenge. Do you, do you see the, well, back in Glasgow, do you see the scaffy wagon? Um, or do you see the actual the connectivity of waste becoming a resource, becoming power, uh, and, and helping to complete that circular economy? Because that's, that's what we see. That's our strategy, and that's how we drive it forward. And to give you an insight to that strategy, um, and looking at what Francis had said this morning, we, we look at three trends that are the main drivers of our strategy and the sector for the next 10 to 15 years. Um, that's legislation, which is incredibly important. Uh, we have population, uh, because we're seeing areas of growth and areas of population shrinkage. We see very sparsely populated areas in big concentrations, and there are different solutions for them. Um, and then we see consolidation. There are too many players in this market too many voices, and it detracts from the quality and it detracts from the drive forward. We need to put that together more cohesively. As a big company, we have a duty to manage our supply chain better and to make sure that they are contributors, but in a focused way. Our strategy, uh, again, to give that game away, it's eight questions. It's dead simple, and I think it applies to the waste sector as well. You start with why. Why are we doing this? And then there are four what questions. What do we know? With a large number of companies, that's where they stop. What do our competitors know? What do our clients know? And then one of the most important questions of all, what do we not know, but we could know because it's out there? Are we interested enough to go and find it? When you answer the four what questions in the context of why, you then move on to the where questions. Where have we been? Where are we at? And then the final strategy question, where can we go? Not where are we going, where can we go, because those are your choices. And if you apply that discipline every single day into the context of national legislation, aspiration, European legislation, how does it apply, and you ask those questions in a disciplined format, you will move forward quite fast. So that, that is the Viridor strategy. It applies very well for me in the challenge of austerity. If I look at those mega trends, as we would call them, austerity, as well as a challenge, is an opportunity for us because it will force us to think differently, especially in the waste sector. So we have to, as I say, get away from waste, start talking about resources, start talking about the value of resources, how they contribute. Let's not talk about scaffy wagons. Let's talk about circular economy, practical examples, 
energy recovery, recycling and reuse, and get that into the language, because it does work. If I look um, closely at the, uh, the sector, the, the biggest opportunities I see are legislation and technology. I think they are vital uh, in terms of moving the sector forward. Government, for me, we have to institute, it's not all about rules and compliance, it's about a performance-based metric. And that's happening as well. On Friday, I'm uh, chairing a, a DEFRA towards smarter environmental legislation. And there's a really good cohort of people working on that and looking at how do we get performance-based metrics. That's a big step forward. It wasn't there when I came back to the UK last year. It's been initiated by central government. I think in Scotland, there are really good examples but it must be progressive, and you cannot allow it to separate. Austerity, generally, one of the, the, the risk areas in austerity is that procurement separates and starts to try to drive to lowest cost. That's a mistake. It's not always the right answer. You have to look at the value equation, and you have to look at economies of scale. So there are some critical areas in there in terms of how we get that performance framework. And then technology. Uh, we have a reliance, and as engineers, uh, waste sector people, we tend to want to not to fail. And that's how the water industry started as well. You know, but we have to have our robust technologies where we cannot fail. But we need to look at near field technologies and far field technologies to improve efficiency. And we need to put them together. Disruptive technologies are very important to us. And that's not just in processing. So as I look forward in our strategy sessions about where can we go and what do we not know, I clearly see a day within the next five years where in our energy recovery facilities, our collection fleets will actually be pre-programmed overnight from RFIDs in facilities that are telling us what the calorific value of what they have on their, on their premises is. And our routes will be pre-planned by technology. And we will collect on the basis of calorific value to make the ERF more efficient. Then we will, we will collect on the basis of making our recycling facilities, our MRFs, more efficient as well. It will not be the basic going around the, the route that's pre-planned and has been there for the last 30 years. That will happen. It's already happening. Chips are cheap, as they say, in the technology sector, and we need to think about how we use them better. The same in products. It will change end to end. Extraction of raw materials will change. Production of materials will change. Use will change. Recycling will change. And reuse will change. And that will all happen fast in our sector because it hasn't been there before. So I would encourage you to think about those type of things. It's very important to us at Viridor. And imagine that future, because it's not far away. If you look to Francis' example of mobile phones, it's changing radically. Another key thing, partnership and collaboration, they have to become the norm. It's one of the areas where we cannot disaggregate down to the lowest level because it's not efficient in this particular type of sector. It is in others. Uh, but not here. So we've got to get economies of scale, cross-sector opportunities, and drive that innovation. And again, as I say, there are some great examples in Scotland. They are practical living examples where we are working in partnership with some of the bigger authorities, and we're putting facilities in place, our glass plant at Newhouse, for example, where we are producing a recycled quality that is equivalent in quality to virgin materials, um, but cheaper. And the Scottish Whiskey Association is delighted by that, as the Scottish Government as well. Those type of things have to happen more often. We have to achieve the economies of scale, but not at the cost of pushing down the lowest players on the scale. We need to bring them into the supply chain because they have a valuable part to play. Um, social and community benefits. Uh, we say it's increasingly important. Actually, it's essential. Um, you cannot build infrastructure without, by definition, becoming part of the community. So we have to look at how we do that education thing. And as you remember, I said at the start, how do we listen better? Drawing the community into your infrastructure design is incredibly important. So things like apprentices, learning centers uh, within the facilities, these are easy to do, they're cost effective, and they actually increase the acceptance of these type of, of plants. Uh, just talking to Linda, who went past one of our plants down in Oxford, which is an energy recovery. We don't call them EFWs anymore. It had a lot of opposition, as you would always expect, for these type of plants. Now that it's been built, it's a high-tech building. Um, it's very visible from the M4. Uh, all the complaints have gone away because people think it's a high-tech sports centre. We've got a massive education centre in there that we bring schools from all around the UK. We bring businesses in there. We teach them about recycling and reuse uh, and, and reducing as well. And it's been very, very well accepted. And now it's part of the community. 
Now we're looking at the heat offtake opportunities as well. These are valuable assets. So getting your community involved, listening to them, communicating with them as well, it's not just increasingly important, it's vital, and it should be an integral part of all of your planning. It certainly is of ours. As I draw to a conclusion, there are still some big questions and opportunities, and we need to address them urgently. There, there always will be. Um, I think we have to ask, is the waste hierarchy fit for purpose? And by that, I mean, is it properly understood? Um, is it connected into the actions and the legislation that we have and the contracts that we have? Have we connected it into communities enough? Because I think we've got a lot of work to do there. But it will happen. As I say, think back to the water industry. Just 10, 15 years ago, two of the AMP cycles, as it was in, in England and Wales, and the QNS cycles here in Scotland. UK has one of the best water industries in the world. I have worked in water all around the world. We have a great model here, and I think the waste sector can be exactly the same. But allied to those questions about legislation and the hierarchies, do we have the right skills? Are we training people in the right way? Because the world is changing. I look at my kids. They don't write anymore. They actually converse in a completely different way. They're coming into the business world in just a few years. And as older people, if I can refer to myself that way, uh, we have to learn a different language. You know, I have to learn. I, I'm not very good at Twitter or the rest of it, but I need to learn it. I accept that. And we need to learn that communication. We need to learn how technology will drive our businesses in future. That's different skill sets from what we have con conventionally employed in this sector. So we have to ask the question about apprenticeships, changing that skill, shet, skill set and making our businesses more and the sector more efficient and more effective and better liked and loved, I would say. But um, the green economy, as we refer to it, it is developing. You know, these are just Viridors facilities. So these are energy recovery facilities. Um, these are the MRFs. Uh, the transfer stations, they are well connected. We have a big strategic plan in terms of how we build them out. Uh, the ERFs, we're now looking at, um, as I say, heat recovery. We are changing the nature of our landfill sites. We're now looking at putting things like cryogenic energy storage, uh, which is essentially a battery type storage, uh, onto our landfill sites using the benefit of uh, waste heat from the, the gas turbines and the benefit of the grid connections. So. Things are happening. Don't let people get you depressed about this sector is not achieving. Uh, another question I was asked by BBC uh, a few weeks ago was, well, you know, uh, it's a 50% recycling target and it looks like we might only hit 46 or 47. Surely that is failure on a large scale. But I just, I can't get myself there. You know, my youngest daughter came back having done her history mock, uh, which was out of 50 as well, and she got 48. If I take the BBC approach, I should tell her that's appalling. She needs to do an awful lot better, and she's completely failed. Actually, I was quite pleased with her. And I think we are making very good progress in terms of our path towards better recycling and better circular economy. So please, don't accept it from people. Be positive and be buoyant. So as always, in terms of how I do these presentations, we, we start where we finish. Um, th that's my message to the waste sector. It's what. I instill in Viridor what my colleagues challenge me on as well. Absolutes are the enemy of progress. If you take it down to a binary question, is it good, bad, is it the right answer, the wrong answer, you failed. This sector is in a transition. It will not look the same in 10 or 15 years. It will be radically different. Just accept that, move on, don't look for perfection, because we are not a perfection area yet. But we are doing some things incredibly well. So hopefully that's given you a little bit of an insight. It may not have been what you were expecting. I was asked to speak about leadership and the challenges of the waste sector, uh, and I'll be happy to take questions at the end of the, the session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. Some inspirational stuff. And you just need to look across this audience to see um, the backgrounds and the disciplines that are already in this room that show that it's, it's, it's all working together in collaboration and, and there isn't a one answer. Um, and also Ian's background in, in the, the water industry and, and the synergies between the two. Water industry we just consider as a utility company. You know, why isn't the waste industry seen in the same way? We are just a utility company at the end of the day. Anyway, on a, a water and a utility type um, slant, then Vicente is our next speaker from Ferrovial. 
Um, he developed his professional career in the chemical industry, waste treatment sector, and in several consulting companies. And he's engaged in production, engineering, and consulting in relation to industrial and environmental processes, particularly waste and water treatment and environmental management. He's a speaker and a teacher in Congress and Masters for Environmental Management and Waste Strategy. He's presently the Director of the Centre of Excellence for Environment in Ferrovial Servicios, the Grupo Ferrovial's branch for cleaning, maintenance and waste management. Thank you, Vicente. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for the invitation to share with you our strategy on to how to are we dealing with these new challenges coming from the circular economy and uh, new concepts like uh, zero waste. Um, I feel that I have uh, two problems. The first is that when you are the second speaker, so, some of the ideas that I would like to share with you has been uh, same by the previous one. But for me, it's very positive, but it's uh, surprising that uh, two leaders' companies, without any previous, previous agreement, are exactly in the same position. This is, as I said, is not a, our agreement. It's because I think that we are considering the same starting point, the same strategy, the same challenges, and the same opportunities. So I will try to focus my presentation in the, in the some differences that we have with, with Viridor. And I like to, to and, the, and the second, the second challenge for me is that my English is not as good as my, <laughs> the previous speaker, <laughs> but I, I hope that you can understand me. So, so it's just to, to introduce the, the company, but very quickly, because the, the main objective of this presentation is to, to, to tell you how are we dealing with these uh, challenges. Uh, probably you know Ferrovial as a construction company. In fact, uh, uh, Ferrovial was, uh, was founded uh, 60 years ago as a construction company, but we are today and currently a global company with different activities, and one of them, very important, is the waste, uh, waste uh, sector and wa waste business. So uh, uh, Ferrovial is divided in four uh, branches. One is services, where, where we are, and in services, trying to, to face these uh, huge challenges, we changed our organization uh, two years ago. I think that uh, the organization of that company is the first step to, to follow the right way that you want to, to resolve the real problems that a company is facing. And did you do it uh, with uh, enough uh, time? Uh, and the, the solution that you can, uh, you can implement and you can decide uh, is uh, much better for, for the company. Uh, for for, for uh, getting a better understanding of wh where are we organize, organized, you can see two sides in this slide. On the, on the left, you see the, the business areas. You, we divided our company in three geographies. The first is uh, uh, UK. UK, we, we use the name of the company Amy. Uh, UK for Ferrovial Services uh, today means more than 60% of, of our activity. So UK and Scotland is very important because we, we are working in different contracts, not just in services, but in the other divisions of, of the company. The second is Spain, and the third is uh, Ferrovial Services International. And on the other side, you, you, you see the knowledge. We split the business and the knowledge. And this was a, a strategic division because we thought in that moment that the challenges that we had to face in the different activities uh, developed by Ferrovial Services were so important that the, that the knowledge sh should be allocated in, in a right place. And the right places are the centers of excellence. We divided uh, the, the knowledge in, in four centers. The first is the infrastructure, is one of the main activities in services. The second is the services provided to citizens, all kinds of services, I think about uh, street uh, uh, cleansing, uh, street lighting, everything in, in a city. The third is the assets, and the fourth is the Center of SLM for Environment, where, where I am. I am the director of this center, and, and the well, these are some figures. The mission of the, the center is to provide a support to our business units, mainly 
to the treatment uh, facilities from the beginning to the end. That means from the idea, and this is why we are responsible for the innovation in waste treatment and in waste collection in ferrovial services, till the end when you are operating the facilities, going through all the process, the design, the bidding, the project, uh, the construction, and the commissioning. This is very important for one company uh, as uh, Ferrovial Services because as Biridor, we are working in different countries in, uh, and we want to, to, to get a direct uh, feedback from the different business units and also to, to get a uh, whole knowledge about where, what are we doing in the different ge geographies. And the, uh, at the same time, if you concentrate, but concentrate doesn't mean to control. It's to, to get the knowledge, to get the skills, to get the experience, and to be ready to share this uh, knowledge with the, our business units. For this reason, the Center of Excellence has uh, one third of the, of the team here in Cambridge one third in Barcelona, in Spain, and one third in Madrid, because we are ready to offer our knowledge to the different business in Poland, in Chile, in Qatar, in the countries where we are uh, working with uh, the different, uh, different businesses. If we move to the reasons uh, why we decided to, to change our organization, our our understanding at that moment was that, uh, of course, the world is changing, our clients are changing, or were changing in that moment, and are still changing. And from, from the left, 10 years or 15 years ago, and they, and the clients were, the private and the public clients were asking for uh, waste management. That uh, mean in that time, collection, transport, treatment, and disposal. Of course, they are today currently asking for the same services, but, but with uh, some uh, conditions like, like here. Uh, we had to, to offer the, at least the same services, the same level of services, but with uh, less money. Because uh, I suppose that, that in, uh, this is the current situation in all the countries. At least we are funding this, uh, this restriction in Europe all around, and all around the world. Also, with uh, some new challenges, zero waste to landfill is clearly a new challenge for, for all the companies. And they are uh, putting uh, or moving the problem to your site, and you have to offer uh, a solution. Also, with uh, some objectives, new objectives, it's uh, quite normal today that uh, if you offer your services to a private company, you mentioned Coca-Cola, it's a good client for us in, in Spain, and they include in the tender that you had to valorize your recovery, 40%, 50%, uh, one different figures uh, of their waste. So this is a, also a condition for uh, being awarded with the contract. And also they, they tell you that they have some preferences. We are now in the construction phase of the Milton uh, Keynes uh, gasification plan, and the client told us uh, uh, we don't like incineration, but we like energy from waste. So we had to be ready to offer a different solution, technological solution, as and the video said. So we need a portfolio of solution ready to offer to your, your clients according to, the, uh, to their preferences. A new requirements, the legal framework has been uh, commented from the beginning in this uh, conference and probably will be in debate in the next uh, sessions. It's a challenge for the councils, it's a challenge for the uh, uh, member states in Europe, but also it's a challenge for the companies. And we are uh, working in this new uh, legal framework to be ready to offer the new solution and the new, uh, and, and the new objectives. And for companies like, like us, uh, local culture is very important. It was also said by the previous, uh, previous speaker, when you offer in countries like the European community, but you move to the Middle East or to South America, you can now go with the same solutions. You had to, to, to get a very, very deep knowledge about the local culture to be sure that the solution is is suitable for, for these uh, local uh, communities. 
And of course, uh, more competitors, uh, uh, that is not new. So we are, how are we doing it? There is a mistake, how we do it? This is the summary of our strategy, and, and I don't mind to share with you because it's, it's public and it's, it's in, in a different documents of the company and in the, in the website of uh, Ferroyal. If you, you have a look to the left, you can see that uh, the first is the integration in the whole supply and value chain. We are working with our clients, as uh, was said, and also with the final uh, uh, companies that can recycle the, the material. So we consider that we are one part of the, of the whole chain and we cannot work alone. Also with a connection with the energy sector, because energy from waste is energy from waste. So, so should be a very good link between the power companies and the, uh, and the, and the uh, waste, uh, waste companies. We are focused on the value of the waste. What was also said by Biridor, we consider now the waste as a, as a raw material. And believe me that the, the huge challenge here is not to convince to the client, it's to convince your own uh, organization, to convince your colleagues, to convince your managers, to convince the operators of the plants that really they have a, a very good material, a raw material, and they have to be, uh, be prepared to recover as much uh, material as possible. This is also linked to the next one, is to consider the, the treatment plant as a manufacturer plant. This is a absolutely change of the mind. We are currently working with the MIT, with the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, with people from the industrial division, because uh, we want that they have a look to our operation and to change from a waste treatment plant, old waste treatment plant, to a new concept, to a new philosophy, to a new uh, paradigm, as is said here. And also looking for the operational efficiency. Uh, I like to also to consider the clients uh, as a partner. If you want to be integrated in the whole chain, you need uh, partners. You need partners on your, si on, on your left or, or, or on your right, because uh, you, you are in the middle. So you need the collaboration of the other sectors and the other companies. And uh, also, I like to, to point out that uh, our pro uh, we decided to pri priori priori to give the priority <laughs> to some <laughs> of the ways. The the priorities are on the on the right. If we talk about the materials, uh, the plastic is a, clearly a priority for all the companies in the sector by volume, I, by the problems that they give or they produce in the treatment plants. Also, the switch sludge. We are dealing in Spain, for example, more than four, 400,000 tons of this material every year, and it's a huge problem because the, the fr legal framework is changing in Europe. Uh, also, we are working, and uh, currently we are uh, in the construction phase of a liquid, liquid uh, field uh, uh, plant from uh, plastic in, in Toledo, in Spain, and also steam and coal production from, uh, from waste. Steam production is very easy, and the district uh, heating is, is normal in Europe, but we are in Spain, and Spain cooling is more important than heating. And surprisingly, there is not solution for cooling in the market. If you, if you think about, uh, for example, boilers for a very low, uh, low power, you cannot find it. So we had to develop, and we are working with some companies in the development of this uh, cooling solution for uh, some companies in, in Spain that are very interested because, as you know, the price of the energy is rising every day. Not, not today, because the petrol, I think, is around $80, $80 per, but uh, probably in the future, the situation will change. So this is the summary of our challenges. On one side, the, the technology, the alternative uses, because it has no sense to recover raw material, if you cannot put again in the market. So we are working together with the other sectors. 
and also the, the legal, the legal and contractual framework as Viridor, Viridor said. So we are working with, uh, and we are members of some of the groups that in Spain are working with the Spanish Ministry of Environment, DEFRA, in, in, here in UK, in some groups with the European Commission, in this new challenge that uh, for the companies means the, the changes that uh, they are trying to introduce in the landfill directive and the waste directive and the, and the packages directive. So we are a very active members of these uh, different, different uh, uh, groups. And you say also the, the different materials where uh, we are working, working on currently, currently working on. So our objective is also, this objective is served with Viridor, a clear uh, regulatory, economical, and market, market uh, framework. Because this is very positive for all the agents, for the administration, for the companies, for the producer of waste, for the recycling uh, companies, for, for everybody. A uh, clear framework, a legal uh, framework uh, uh, common is, uh, uh, is, uh, has a lot of advantages because you can uh, get the scale economies, uh, economy of scale, as uh, also was said by, by Viridor, and that means that you have more opportunities to reintroduce the, the waste and the flow in the market. And the last one is we think that the circular economy is turning uh, the always sector into resource industry. The summary, I think, is 90% the same that uh, the, the Viridor <laughs> messages. <laughs> is a key role of the resource industry, working together, all the, all the industry, but also the regulatory bodies, management alliances between different actors and the stakeholders, it's a clearly a win-win strategy. Requires contract, uh, contacts and lobbying capabilities. Uh, as we think that this is very important. Uh, lobby is a positive uh, word in, in English, but it's very negative in Spanish. Uh, because the, the ministries are reluctant to contact the, the industry, but we are, we are strongly convincing them that, then that uh, we have uh, uh, some knowledge and we are able to give them solutions. Money barriers are specific for particular countries, as we, we said. Also, for us, the public-private collaboration is a, is, a key, is a key issue. So this, that's all. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Very, very similar. 3,000 miles of very similar messages and, and very similar challenges uh, across the piece. Um, so we've got about 15 minutes um, to take some questions from the floor. Um, did you notice actually that Vicente speaks his English faster than we do, which is quite difficult for Scots. <laughs> um, but um, if you'd like to ask a question, please say who you are and where you come from, and uh, be mindful but to be clear in your questioning then uh, for the panel, just for Ian's benefit. Yeah. Um, can I take some questions, please? We're not a silent audience. Karen. <laughs> She's not a silent guy. <laughs> Go for it. Thank you. Uh, Karen McKenzie from Biobags, born in Govan almost 60 years ago. <laughs> um, I'd like to ask this time of transition, and you're you started with that, and you ended with public-private collaboration. Um, people in the lo local authority sector who have actually managed to come here today or tomorrow, if they can get out of the office, I think they'd recognise that they're overworked and underfunded. They may not have the skills needed or the efficiencies of scale, and um, the budget for communication is somewhat limited. Is it time for a new strategy for the public sector? Um, is it time for the local authorities to outsource to the professionals without meaning to insult anybody from the local authorities here? Um, it's a political question. Edinburgh tried a couple of years ago to outsource to, they had a big tender and they ended up keeping it within the city. Um, what do the speakers say based on your international experience? 
Can you just, um, well, other brands are available, obviously, but could you see you taking over the public sector? Um, no, in its entirety, as I say, absolutely. You know, it's, it's not one or the other for me. I think the, the, the biggest challenge, and looking at, you know, I understand budgets are stretched, trust me, in Virudor they're pretty stretched as well. <laughs> uh, and we're all working hard, and we can never communicate well enough. But I, I, I do think technology offers some opportunities for uh, a, a large number of the authorities in, in any country I've worked in. Uh, you know, people, it was mentioned about the US, how wonderful it is. Well, I've lived in the US, and actually there's some states in the US that are borderline third world, if I'm being insulting, I don't mean it that way, but so it, it, it's not an absolute. I, I think we've got to look at the, the partnership element better. I think there, is a, a, there are combinations of doing things, and, and time for change is maybe just doing things differently, uh, doing the same thing a little bit differently, more effectively, more efficiently than wholesale change. So I, I look at, um, as I say, the example of what we're doing with Glasgow just now, uh, I think works really well. We're doing the same in Manchester. Uh, and those are quite big models, but when we go down to the southwest where we're working in Exeter and Devon County Council, it's a partnership but in a different way because the challenges are very different. So I wouldn't say to you it's time for everybody in local authorities to give up and go to the dark side, uh, but um, you know, there, there are some great examples of people doing it very well. But I think the partnership element is the most important for me. I, I, I agree. For me, a very common uh, situation in Spain uh, is when a uh, city council calls you and, and, and tell that uh, they have been visiting a fair, and for example, they have, uh, be, uh, they have uh, in contact with a new company that offers a new technology, very good, and this is the solution for the waste, apparently. So you, you have to convince that uh, there are more, more things around the uh, technology. The technology is not uh, the, uh, the uh, solution alone, uh, you have to consider other factors. And one important uh, issue is the, the, the state of the art. When you talk about this, well, uh, you, you have to face a lot of problems because normally you have to deal with, uh, let's say, 100, uh, 100,000 tons uh, per year immediately. So some of the technologies, the new technology uh, needs or, or takes uh, a lot of time for the uh, final development. So um, technology is, is, is good, but and the other factors are also very important. And you have to convince a partnership is the, is the solution. Uh, normally, I prefer to start a debate to, to get a better understanding of the real needs and the uh, social framework in this uh, county, on this council, and at the end, to decide uh, together the solution. Could I be specific in terms of partnerships for the local authorities as well, and sometimes without the private sector? I think the local authorities, yeah. austerity is going to drive us that way. But I look at the AGMA example, for example, and think that actually works pretty well, and it could go a little bit further, and that's without the private sector being involved. And then you look at some of the other devolved models, so the Welsh model of trying to disaggregate out to a very small level, and it's questionable how effective that is. Okay, thank you very much, Karen. Ray. Thank you. Ray Georgeson from the Resource Association. Um, very good presentations, gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, in the spirit of looking ahead, I wonder if you might give us a few thoughts on um, uncertainties that might now be generated as a result of the debate over the UK's continued membership of the EU. And uh, secondary to that, whether you feel that the resources industry should be speaking out a bit more forcefully about the value of Britain's membership of the European Union. I think, I think that was a leading question, the second one, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. We might not have that view. <laughs> you know, to you. The, there is a, an important challenge uh, when you consider the, the whole cycle, because, uh, and this was discussed, I remember when we, we were working in the directive uh, four or five years ago, because there is a, a gap between the production of goods the waste sector and the recovery sector. We tried, and there was a proposal from Spain to integrate at least, or at least to, to, to include some articles linking the, the three sector, but it was impossible because apparently uh, there are other legal framework for the production of different goods and the other different 
for marketing the, the, the product. So this is a real challenge, and we are very concerned about it, because if you are in the, in the waste sector, and you can recover, or you improve your, uh, your processes and, and your facilities, and suddenly you find a, a lot of products, a lot of tonnage of products, and you cannot sell or give to a third party, a third sector, is a real, real problem. So you, you are right. So the, the solution is to push to the authorities, to push Brussels, to push here, <laughs> Scotland or Spain, that please consider that should be an integration in the, in the different sector uh, through the, the, the whole chain. I think for me, I mean, we don't really have a political view in the company, but the world is becoming a much more connected place. It happens instantaneously. It's faster. So it's difficult to see whether you're politically in or out of Europe, how you wouldn't be trading with them in the first place. Uh, and I think that's one of the most important areas to look at. Quality and standards are critical as well. So Europe's setting quite an ambitious agenda for us. That's a good thing for me. Um, it's part of that leadership issue. But there are difficult areas as well. So if you look at RDF, for example, and you look at resources from that perspective, and you have facilities here, why would you pay to export them for someone else to use them? Um, that, that seems a little bit perverse to me. And I think we have to, you have to be able to work both sides of those equations. So I, I, you know, to answer your first question, any political uncertainty is not a good thing at all. Um, you know, we saw, we saw that here where things came to a bit of a stop for a while, uh, and I have had no vote. I don't live in Scotland, so I have no political agenda. Um, but I think now, you know, that, that was a, a great example of, of actually people got interested, uh, and they really, democracy was proven to work in that way, and we got an answer, and we're moving forward on that. That's a good thing. If we're going to go to a referendum, let's do it quickly uh, and just get it sorted out and, and then move on. Uh, we will continue to trade with Europe regardless of what that answer is, and I think we will still be set standards. The world now doesn't always get standards through legislation. I, I worked in a coal mine. I was in a coal mine in Peru about five years ago, and they polluted the water supply. That was a, a global instant within an hour, and it was fixed in the headquarters of that mining company the next day. Ten years ago, without social media, that would never have happened. So that's how fast you can be regulated through social media now. So it's a more complex and complicated world. Thank you very much. Join behind you. John Quinn, uh, CIWM and ARC21 in Northern Ireland. Um, you guys represent to me the waste sector which provides services, historically and uh, end of pipe services in terms of waste generated. How do you actually see yourselves uh, moving up the value chain and engaging with designers, manufacturers, retailers, distributors? How, how is that physically going to be done in your world in terms of your business model? Um, for me, that's already happening. Uh, we work uh, in strategic forums now with uh, a number of the, the major uh, retailers in the UK, for example, where we work with government in terms of future strategy. Uh, Viridor is uh, not just a services company, we're a product company as well. So we'll produce energy, we'll produce certain products, we'll sell them in. So it, it, it's vastly different from the company it even was five, ten years ago. Uh, so I think it's already happening. In technology areas, we have um, technology forums with most of the major universities or a number of major universities in the UK. Uh, and we, we look at that in terms of how we apply innovation. So I think we're well beyond the services element now. Yes. I will yeah, try to give you two, two answers. Personally, I am, I am teaching and giving a lot of uh, uh, presentation like here, for example, in the design, design schools in, in Spain. And also, we are in contact with uh, big companies like Sara, probably you, you know this Spanish company. Uh, they are very concerned about the uh, recyclability of their, their, uh, their products and, the, and their goods. So we are starting to work. I say starting to work because, uh, um, for example, with other, with other um, big, uh, big supermarkets, also we are in this moment starting uh, inno innovation, innovative projects uh, for recovery as much uh, goods as, as possible. And uh, we are trying to, to be awarded with an Horizon 2020 20 project and uh, working together with the, the sector in, in Spain. Is, 
is uh, for me is, is developing, but uh, very, very, very slowly. So uh, we we keep uh, this contact because in, in fact they are our clients. So they they ask, ask you we have a problem. We have to collaborate in the in the solution. So there is there is a contact, there is a collaboration, but uh, should be improved in the next years. Thank you very much, Alistair. Thank you, thank, thank you Linda. Uh, Alistair Meldrum from Melbourne Environmental. Just picking up on Ian's points about apprenticeships and learning new skills, well, one of the things I'd like to see enforced within the industry is trying to make sure we have the right existing skills, because the, the training and development of staff that goes into staff in the sector is, is generally very poor. Uh, what's your views, Ian, on how do we go about trying to attract apprentices into the industry when they've got lots of other competing things that they can do in much, probably much more exciting industries than the waste management industry? Mm -hmm. um, I might contend that this is quite an exciting industry. I gave up a life in Colorado where I skied every weekend to come back here and work in the waste sector. Uh, I think this, this sector actually has some really exciting challenges. I think our challenge is to communicate that better. We're not good at communicating that out. We have to attract people in, but that's the way we're seeing a lot of success. Um, you know, we've got our own um, degree program now, a foundation degree program in Verida. We've got some of our uh, graduates in the audience today. Um, we're seeing in our graduate intakes uh, for the first time, uh, it's more than 50% of them are women coming into the sector now, which is a big change as well, and welcome. So I, I think it really comes to that. We have to improve our training and development. I've been very vocal about health and safety in this sector. I think it's appalling. Um, and I came in and one of the first things I did was when I joined the ESA board, I said I was not signing up to a 10% reduction because actually you were really saying you're going to hurt several thousand people a year. Uh, so we've said zero harm. And this sector really needs to make some big strides forward in that. But it's happening, it's, it's coming. I, I genuinely sense, particularly amongst younger people, that, that they find the whole recycling, reuse type thing, as long as you don't call it waste, they find it quite interesting. The ERF facilities, when we take the schools around them, it's usually the teachers and the parents who get really excited about it as well. So more and more of that stuff, I have to say, and eliminate the bad stuff. I can give you two examples, one in UK, another in Spain. In UK, Amy, our our British company, has a program of, uh, of teenagers uh, to for in the in the contract where we are working and in the city like Birmingham, for for example. And in Spain, uh, I am as I say a teacher at the Madrid University. I am teaching, for example, circular economy, and we are introducing this new concept to the graduates. And these graduates, after they finish the the, the master. They, they come to the, to the company, so they are getting from the beginning a, a, new, a new knowledge and new mentality and new skills that uh, can help them to transform the company. Thank you very much. I think um, it'd be interesting to do a straw poll around the audience against age and how many of the, I'm putting myself in the older generation, I actually intended to end up in the waste and resources industry. And whether that's actually changed and whether we have, through more training and development and, and more of the recycle and reuse type um, audience, whether there's a younger generation who have deliberately actually joined us. I know once you're here, you can't get away from it. It sucks you in, but um, actually who, who started out life and then. Anyway, that's the end of our, our international session for this morning. Thank you very much to, to both our speakers and, and to everyone in the audience. Just before you head off for lunch then, a few things. Um, we have, in, in previous year, had a speed networking um, event uh, over in, in the exhibition thing. And this year, we, we've kind of called it a surgery. So, um, so this year, we have SIPA and we have Zero Waste Scotland available for all of your moans, groans, questions, queries, all that kind of stuff. Um, that opens at half past one, so get your lunch first, and then from half past one, people from Zero Waste Scotland and SEPA will be available to take any questions, particularly on um, landfill tax, which is something that um, um, we're, we're in the middle of debating at the moment, and, and resource efficiency as well. So that's all good. Can I ask all Alupro bursary recipients to go to the Alupro stand for 145 for a photo? So get dolled up for that. And we'll be back here at um, two o'clock for the afternoon session. Thank you very much to all of us. Thank you.